Leo Smoot was a remarkable man, and you have to consider what he accomplished in the time frame. Back in the 1800s in Salt Lake, uh, very, very difficult. He was mayor during a, a lot of problems, a lot of growing pains going on. He did a remarkable job, created greatly uh, to his church as well as to his community. And I guess I would say he, he left a tremendous legacy that all of us should learn from. Each of us should learn and hope we would leave some sort of legacy for the future that would be helpful to those who follow us. It would be too much to say that he had no faults because no man lived who had not some human weakness. But the noble characteristics of his nature, the power of his spirit for good, so overshadowed his weaknesses that they sank into insignificance. Joseph F. Smith. Abraham Owen Smoot was a Southerner. Born to George Smoot and Nancy Ann Rowlett in 1815 in Owen County, Kentucky, A.O., as he was called, was a sickly child who became so sick at the age of nine that burial clothes were sewn for him. But an early death was not meant for A.O., and by some miracle, he survived. Since there is not much written history of A.O. between 1815 and the mid-1830s, we can only assume that he grew up as most other boys of that time, working hard and helping his mother and father. Then a marvelous thing happened. In 1914, nearly a hundred years after the birth of A.O., a very old and unassuming bread box was passed from the hands of Diana Eldridge Smoot, a surviving wife of A.O.'s, to Orson Parley Smoot. The treasure it yielded was tremendous. Papers, letters, and journals were housed inside this wonderful box. And from these accounts, the earliest dating back to the 1830s, we find A.O. Smoot, the extraordinary yet ordinary man. December 25th, Christmas Day, spent by me in the most agreeable manner of all Christmases, in the house of the Lord, pouring upon the head of the high priest in the 70s the holy anointing oil which filled their hearts with gladness and joy. The decade of the 1830s was a monumental time for A.O. He was baptized a member of the Mormon Church in 1835 at age 20, was called on three missions for the church, and met and married his first wife, Margaret Thompson McMeans Atkinson. Margaret was a divorcee in 1838, six years older than A.O., who also had a 10-year-old son, it's unclear when or how they exactly met. It's first documented in journals that A.O. met up with three families of saints, as they referred to themselves, at the Ohio River on their way to Missouri and continued on together. Margaret was on that journey. They were betrothed before they left Tennessee. A.O. and Margaret's life was full of strife and sorrow, like most of the other persecuted saints during those early years of the church, as the faithful were forced from their land and homes again and again. No doubt, A.O. kept close to his heart the patriarchal blessing he received from Joseph Smith, Sr. If thou keepest the commandments of God, thou shalt become great upon the earth, like unto Elijah. Thou shalt become great with thy brethren, but after the death of the prophet Joseph Smith, to whom A.O. remained true throughout every slanderous persecution, A.O. and his family left civilization with the rest of the saints. As he left Nauvoo, just as when they had left Missouri and Ohio, A.O. left a legacy of obedience, courage, and steadfastness. A.O.'s devotion to the saints inspired Wilfred Woodruff to bless A.O. thusly. At all time, when thou hast been called upon, Thou hast been ready to go and to do whatever thou hast been counseled by the brethren to do, and hast been willing to lay down thy life for the cause. Before Ao and Margaret left Nauvoo, both felt and agreed that they should enter into the practice of polygamy. As Ao departed for the West, his family consisted of Margaret and her son, whom Ao legally adopted, along with two other wives, Sarah Gibbons, 15 years his senior, and who divorced him in 1852, and Emily Hill, who was to bear him five children. A.O. and his family left Nauvoo in 1846 and left winter quarters for the West in May of 1847. And though they left much behind, it was in Utah that A.O. would make his mark. The valley was a barren waste of a country with nothing but sagebrush and a few straggling cottonwood trees growing on the banks of the streams. Margaret wrote, she must have had mixed emotions as she entered this barren country. 
but like they had done in other places, the family got down to living. A.O. secured a large farm which provided employment and food for his family in what is now Sugar House. Life for the Smoots was the same as it was for every other pioneer in the valley, hard. Every family was on an allowance, and at mealtime, in many a family, a small corn cake would be made and cut in as many pieces as there were members in the family, and each one had one piece. If they still remained hungry, and who wouldn't on such a meager meal, they were obliged to make out their meal with roots, greens, or anything else they could find. And to make their trials worse, the crickets seemed determined to eat up their crops. But as the famous history goes, the Lord sent the gulls to save the grain for the sustenance of the people. All this has been told many times and is familiar to many, but is nevertheless true. A.O. and his family struggled and worked hard over the next 20 years, serving missions and church callings. He was called home from a mission to England by Brigham Young to lead the first group of saints across the plains under the Perpetual Emigration Fund. He was also mayor of Salt Lake City for 10 years. And by 1868, he and his family included four wives, A.O. having married Diana Tanner Eldridge in 1855 and Anne Christine Moritzen in 1856. And for the first time in his life, he and his family were comfortably housed in a commodious home. A.O., along with his wives and children, had worked hard to arrive at this bucolic existence. And though it could be certainly assumed that A.O. was enjoying this settled existence, Brigham Young had something else quite different in mind. The city of Provo had its problems. Liquor consumption, gambling, vagrancy, all the ills that could affect a frontier town affected Provo, Utah. Provo was in need of a new spiritual life, according to Wilford Woodruff, now a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. And it needed strong men to guide its destiny and make it a center of one of the leading stakes of the church. Brigham Young was of like mind and summoned A.O. into his office. The prophet is reported to have said, There are three places all on a par. One is as good as the other. They are Provo, Hell, or Texas. You can take your choice. Family tradition indicates that A.O. protested this call, likely thinking that his past 30 years of continual travel and service entitled him to some comfort and security. I would rather go to hell than to Provo, A.O. replied. But he did not go to hell. He went to Provo. In Provo, A.O. was quickly put to work. He was president of the Utah State for 27 years, which at that time was the whole of the Utah Valley. He was presiding bishop as well as mayor of Provo for 14 years. He was heavily involved in business, as a letter from Brigham Young records. President Young told me to join with two men and to, and I quote, raise sufficient money to buy the machinery needed for a woolen mill and to send east for it forthwith. I was told to stop your crying about wool, O ye of little faith, and of possible less works. And at his behest I did so for we should be willing to be dictated by the priesthood in all our ways. A.O. was also involved in banking and was responsible for the construction of the Provo Tabernacle. Further, he was in lumber and real estate. He established the Provo Co-op Institution and was a legislative representative of the Utah Territory. One can only wonder if A.O. felt that perhaps now he had achieved some sort of stature in the community, that perhaps finally he might relax and enjoy the fruit of his labor. But again, Brigham had something else in mind for A.O. From the beginnings of the church, education was an important part of the Mormon faith. And formal education, and more importantly, affordable education, was out of the reach for most children of the struggling pioneers. With this in mind, Brigham Young contacted A.O. We should seek substantial information. We should pluck fruit from the tree of knowledge and taste. And then shall our eyes be open to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. I desire you, Brother Smoot, to turn your influence and energies to the building up of an academy. And in doing so, you will be blessed, and the Lord will prosper you. But it was not until August of 1876 that the academy formally opened. The Lewis Building that had been chosen was in deplorable condition. It would take hundreds of dollars to renovate the building, money that was very hard to come by in the 1870s. 
hundreds of dollars that was quietly donated by the president of the Board of Trustees, A. O. Smoot. By 1883, over 400 students, men and women, crowded into the Lewis Building on Center Street. The Academy thrived. Then, in January of 1884, a fire consumed the Lewis Building, and it seemed that the dream that was the Brigham Young Academy was to become like the wood beams of the building, gone up in smoke. But A.O. had not worked so long and so hard and had not given his word to Brigham Young idly. At 10 a.m. the next day, A.O. called a meeting in the tabernacle and said to the board, faculty, and students, School will convene as usual at half past eight tomorrow. Classes will meet at the bank, the Smoot store, the basement of the meeting house, and the Jones building. Anywhere an adequate space can be found, we shall meet. A devastating fire, yet only one day of school was lost. With the destruction of the old building came financial trials for A.O. When Brigham Young died in 1877, he had not been able to sign the deeds for the $40,000 in property and bonds. The responsibility of the debt fell upon A.O. For years, the Academy languished, housed in a lowly warehouse. And for years, A.O. implored and urged the church for financial support for a new, glorious, and sorely needed building. But the church was unable to comply. As glorious as the building was, it was financially prohibitive. Yet the Board of Trustees secured $100,000 in loans, A.O. mortgaging his home and farm, and construction began. Again in February 1895, after 20 years of being the caretaker and foster father of the Brigham Young Academy, A.O. went one final time to Salt Lake City to plead with the now president of the church and his lifelong friend, Wilfred Woodruff, to relieve the financial embarrassments that weighed heavily on the Academy and upon A.O. President Woodruff assured him that something would be done. Hopeful, A.O. returned to his home in Provo and passed away just a few days later. Funeral services in the Provo Tabernacle for A.O. Smoot were said to be among the most impressive ever witnessed in the pioneer Utah Territory. And what started out as merely the dream of one to educate his people in the wilderness grew into the dream of millions. What started out as a trade academy became a hall of learning which grew into the world-class university we know today. But why did he do it? It must have been more than just blind obedience. A.O. said it himself in a letter to his wife, Annie, in 1893. Annie, I haven't a piece of property that is not mortgaged. I've had to do it to raise money to keep the Brigham Young Academy going. That was given to me as a mission, and I would sooner lose all than fail in fulfilling this responsibility. I love that school and I can see what it means to our youth to have spiritual as well as book learning. It must live. A.O. loved the school. It's that simple. And upon the occasion of the dedicatory exercises in the new academy, President Joseph F. Smith offered the following words. When the roll of honor is read of the names who have made this academy what it is today, second only to the illustrious name of its founder, Brigham Young, will stand the name and fame of Abraham O. Smoot. <laughs>